Good morning, everyone. This is Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 52. Uh, this morning I'm going to make an experiment. Um, I've been producing these uh, adventures in one-hour segments pretty much because I'm limited uh, when I do uh, a solo webinar uh, to about an hour or a little more and it will cut off. Now I've tried another arrangement which will allow me to continue for a longer time and not have to use uh, interim moments um, to uh, wait for the next opportunity. In other words, um, I'm going to make a longer webinar this morning if it does work. And we'll see how it works for you. Uh, hopefully I won't get cut off. We shall see. Um, we were discussing the triple sun, the physical sun, which influences the mutable uh, cross and the personality, of course, if it influences the personality, it influences as well the astral uh, vehicle and the uh, lower mental vehicle, all of which are part of the dense physical body of the solar logos. Uh, from a certain point of view, um, the dense physical body of the solar logos will even include the, uh, the ego on the higher mental plane, but we uh, do not find that the physical sun is the influence of, uh, upon that ego. Rather, it is the heart of the sun, which influences the fixed cross and the cross of the soul. And this is where the cross or a series of energies through which the soul on the higher mental plane, or at least soul consciousness as we know it on the higher mental plane, is coming into prominence. Um, it is the quality of consciousness, particularly, that is being uh, dealt with here. And let's see if I can bring these all together. Yes, it is consciousness. And consciousness is simply another name for soul, as we know. The soul on the higher mental plane is not the only instance of soul. The spiritual triad is an instance of soul and the awareness of the monad is also an instance of soul. Any type of awareness in cosmos is an instance of soul. The central spiritual sun then is our monadic aspect, and it influences uh, the cardinal cross upon which we have not yet stepped, and it is the life, uh, the life aspect. Let's see if I can get this looking a little better here. One day, I suppose, I can send this document to you, I suppose. So we had ended then uh, on page 111. And the Tibetan goes on to say, By the word influencing, I here refer to the energies pouring from these three aspects of the sun through the three crosses to our planet. And I would say this would mean uh, from the sun, not necessarily to the zodiacal constellations, but through the three crosses as these crosses, capitalize that, are uh, signs which concentrate the influences of the constellations to our planet. We are remembering the distinction between uh, constellations as galaxies of stars and signs as concentrated influences of those constellational energies made available to our Earth. Okay, so um, the even though we may be born uh, in uh, one of the cardinal signs, or, uh, well, let's say one of the cardinal signs, it does not necessarily mean that the energies of the central spiritual sun, the monadic aspect of our solar logos, will reach us in any way that we can register. And for the average individual, even though he may be born in one of the fixed signs, it does not mean that the energies of the heart of the sun will reach him in a way that he can register. So anyway, ponder on this. 
And remember also that our sun is traveling through space with its own directed motion, its own proper motion, carrying our solar system along in its sphere of influence. And many spirals are thus created because the apparent, um, the, the uh, rotation, the revolution of the planets around the sun become a spiral as that sun through uh, progress onward, through a, a type of straight line action, creates spirals. But our sun is also in the process of revolution, and that revolution is around the Pleiades. So we have many motions simultaneously, and we are uh, not occupying uh, as a solar system the same, uh, if we can call it, section of space. Uh, in one moment as we were in the previous moment. So the Sun is also traveling through space, carrying our own solar system in its sphere of influence around our own central and conditioning star, which it has been rightly presumed exists in the constellation Taurus, the bull being found in the Pleiades, and since those um, those Pleiades are so concentrated, so close to each other, we might well consider the Sun and its associated solar systems in the seven solar systems of which ours is one as revolving around the Pleiades as a whole, but that central star, uh, that central star uh, is um, Alcyone, he tells us, and that is the central star of the Pleiades. It's sometimes called the star of the individual. DK will elaborate upon this and, of course, in the charts of disciples, the locations of some of these stars should be um, noted and the uh, aspects made to them or their position uh, on angles and so forth or on other astrological factors with a very tight orb, usually given as about one degree. Um, these stars are effective in our lives. They may be effective along an entire uh, range of influence from very mundane to very spiritual. I don't think we can uh, expect uh, the fullness, or any degree of the fullness of the spiritual influence of such stars until after the third initiation, when we have um, what is called the first solar initiation. In other words, it's a it's an initiation which relates to our solar logos, and stars are the bodies of manifestation of solar logos. So only when we begin taking the solar initiations can the spiritual effect of the so-called fixed stars begin to apply. At the same time, it appears from the standpoint of our planet to be passing through the, the 12 signs of the zodiac or against the 12 constellations or through the orbit of the Earth uh, uh, dividing which you have the 12 signs. But notice the word appears, it appears to be passing through. And that, of course, is uh, an illusion based upon the uh, revolution of our Earth around the Sun. This is a symbol macrocosmically considered. Uh, it reveals uh, to the student, a certain availability of energies, but it's not, you know, really, it's not really happening. Um, this is a symbol mac macrocosmically considered of the dramatic centralized point of view of the individual human being. And when the word dramatic is used, we immediately think of the word Leo, Leo and the self-centered attitude. Uh, which is uh, so often found in the early stage of the experience and through which uh, humanity is still passing because uh, the great majority of human beings are not yet uh, even uh, centralized personalities. They are on their way to becoming so. This is a symbol macrocosmically considered of the dramatic centralized point of view of the individual uh, human being the microcosm. It's a geocentric, the geocentric point of view whereby all of the heavenly bodies appear to be 
revolving around the stationary Earth is uh, analogous to the uh, egoistic uh, point of view of the individual personality where all of life seems to be uh, revolving around it and where this uh, egoistic personality is the center of the sphere of consciousness. It is the pre decentralized point of view. Let's call it that. Pre-decentralized point of view. It is interesting to compare the symbolism and the underlying truth connected with the lesser and greater zodiacs and with their 12-month and 25,000-year cycles. Well, this is one way he describes the greater and lesser zodiac. The, uh, the lesser zodiac is the apparent passage of the sun through all of the 12 uh, phases of the Earth's uh, orbit around the sun, uh, the 12 uh, divisions of the ecliptic, whereby we pass through all the 12 signs, the 12 divisions of the ecliptic. That is the lesser zodiac. Uh, he's, he defines them in different ways at different times. Lesser zodiac. Uh, sometimes uh, we will see, he will define lesser and greater zodiacs in different ways. The 25,000 year cycle is called, um, and, and it's an approximation because I think uh, the actual figure given uh, when a processional age is measured is at 2160 years, is 25,920 uh, years, something like that. When you, when you multiply um, 20, Five, um, when you multiply 2,160 by 12, you get something like 25,920 years. I haven't got my calculator here at the moment, but I think that's about what it is. You can work it out for yourself. But anyway, this is an approximation. And um, overlap periods are involved and counted in a certain way. So the 25,000 year cycle is called the uh, Great Platonic Year. And it represents one uh, complete uh, revolution of 12 uh, equinoctial ages. Uh, 12 uh, ages, uh, an age of Pisces, of Aquarius, of Capricorn, and so forth, until 12 of these 2,160-year periods are covered. Uh, one complete uh, revolution, or well, let's say one complete gyration of the Earth's uh, axis. And uh, these uh, great ages are also, we un uh, come to understand, ruled by one particular uh, constellation of the zodiac, the sign of the zodiac. We are presently leaving a 25,000 year cycle, which has been under the influence of Pisces. and. Um, moving retrogressively, clockwise, into a 25,000 year age, which is going to be ruled by Aquarius. I don't think we're quite there yet. DK says we're almost there, but our type of astrology cannot uh, determine the exact points of entrance into this 25,000 year period. So uh, it's really quite an amazing idea that we will be having a double age of Aquarius and that even after 2,160 years, beginning in the year 2117, where the lesser Aquarian age happens, even after that age gives way in a little more than 2,000 years to the age of Capricorn, we will still be in the greater age of Aquarius. So it is interesting to compare the symbolism of the underlying truth connected with the lesser and the greater zodiacs and with their 12-month and 25,000-year cycles. There's a complete uh, gyration of the Earth's axis uh, by means of which our planet uh, passes through the influence of all 12 signs in a vast planetary uh, effect. Whole ages are ruled by a particular sign. And then finally, a 25,000-year period, all ruled by one sign with many sub-signs, the 12 sun signs. Um, and then uh, it will give way, perhaps, 
it looks like, to a 25,000 year age of Capricorn, in which uh, we may presume that a particular ray accompanies that 25,000 year period. We don't know exactly. Well, we do know that the seventh ray will accompany the, the 2,160 year period of Aquarius, sometimes rounded off to 2,500. We do not know whether that same seventh ray will accompany a 25,000 year cycle, but some ray will, and uh, maybe the seventh. Uh, this is a tremendous study, and the masters know these cycles. They bear out, it is said, these two cycles, they bear out great platonic year, let's call it the greater zodiac, uh, by one appellation. I'm not sure. Later he's going to refer to the, um, the sun sign and the rising sign, I think, as lesser and greater zodiacs. We will see. They bear out much that I have given you anent the soul. Influenced by the esoteric planets, eventually, and the personality influenced by the orthodox planets, or by the uh, planets in their uh, esoteric and orthodox uh, expressions. Every one of us as a soul, the soul in incarnation, will be influenced by certain qualities of the planets when they are functioning uh, esoteric. Because all, all planets are simply planets, but they have orthodox and esoteric functions. So we want to uh, note, oops, we want to note, I can do that, note the orthodox and esoteric functions of functions of every planet. In other words, uh, you know, whereas uh, an exoteric function of Mercury can simply relate uh, to the concrete mind and its uh, reasoning and correlations, an esoteric function of Mercury can relate to uh, contact with the mind of God or uh, with a deep intuitive uh, access. So uh, when the uh, planetary rays uh, hit our forms, as it were, depending on what area within our constitution they strike or influence, will we'll be their uh, particular uh, influence. Now the greater zodiac is symbolic of the soul and the lesser of the personality. I suppose that every year, Every time we have a complete uh, yearly zodiacal cycle, we have had the opportunity to grow within our personality. But the great soul cycles are longer, and uh, perhaps if we're examining the growth of the soul on its own plane, if that's what this means, then we look for greater zodiacal cycles. I, I would think, though, that with every uh, precessional age of even 2160 or 2500 years, the soul would have some kind of marked growth, especially if one is uh, on the path. So the greater zodiac, this greater zodiac is symbolic of the soul and the lesser of the personality. In the personality cycle, the lesser zodiacal condition, the lesser zodiac conditions the personality career, and the twelve houses are of dominant importance. In other words, we are still circumstantially focused and later the detached individual learns that circumstances are non-compelling. This is uh, learned, I think, uh, in one instance in Leo, uh, especially when Uranus is the veiled ruler of Leo, that one is entirely positive to circumstance and circumstance can no longer compel. This is a condition of detachment in which the true identity is not only understood, but uh, deeply felt. But most people are caught up in circumstances and uh, what we say, hey, what's happening around me? And that determines how the life goes. But it's what, happen it's what happens within me, regardless of what happens around me, that becomes a real moment uh, in the case of the disciple. Yes. Okay. Later, the influence of the 12 signs supersedes the influence of the planet. So actually, the constellational energy through the 12 signs 
becomes more important than the planets. But let us still remember, yeah, I mean, we have discussed uh, the ways in which uh, these uh, constellation signs influence the soul and how they also have a monadic influence. But let us not think that the planets uh, themselves, though they are lesser planetary lords, do not have a lot to do with even very high initiations. So planets are gods after all. They are a solar systemic uh, deities within the solar system, and they can have a tremendous uh, effect even on the higher uh, stages of human uh, development. Now, for instance, when I think of the Great Decision, which is taken at the Sixth Initiation, in which we as a monad decide which of uh, seven or nine paths we will pursue, uh, I cannot help but think that a very high influence of the planet Saturn as the major ruler of Libra is involved in that uh, great decision. So, you know, although ordinary uh, non-aspiring individuals are much um, influenced by the planets as they work out through the houses or circumstantial areas of the chart, um, more advanced people are indeed influenced by the lords of the planets as they represent uh, different zodiacal constellations, and then of course by the constellations themselves which have their own ray energies transmitted. I would like to em I would like also to emphasize, perhaps unnecessarily, that Sirius, the Great Bear and the Pleiades, work through the medium of the twelve uh, constellations. Uh, this is um, uh, <coughs> this this uh, setup is found in the diagrams we have later in esoteric uh, astrology. Uh, there are different kinds of rays uh, coming through um, the Great Bear Pleiades and Sirius, and uh, the will aspect of the seven rays is transmitted by the Great Bear. Uh, perhaps the more material or intellectual aspects with the Pleiades and the love aspect through Sirius, whatever we do mean by Sirius, whether we mean a single star, several stars, or an entire uh, system of stars. So, but these are the, are the three great constellations, and generally, uh, unless we get into it in too much detail, they represent the father aspect, Great Bear, the mother aspect, Pleiades, and the aspect of the Divine Son, which is Sirius or the Cosmic Christ, although there are many Cosmic Christs, as I've said, the Cosmic Christ of a certain scope uh, Sirius represents. Uh, pouring, uh, uh, pouring their influences through nine of them in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that these major constellations are not part of the zodiac with which we are concerned. Uh, the zodiac with which we are concerned is the twelve-fold zodiac, which is the heart and the head center of the great constella super constellational deity we call the one about whom naught may be said, at least one of the ones about whom naught may be said. Uh, these super constellations work through nine of our constellations particularly, and we could um, we could pick and choose which we which we would assign to the different groupings. Um, we already have some assignments. For instance, we already have on page 50 of Esoteric Astrology the fact that Aries and Libra are, are connected with the Great Bear. We already have uh, Gemini and Sagittarius connected with Pleiades. We already have Cancer and Capricorn connected with Sirius. And as well, uh, we have Taurus and Scorpio connected with the seven solar systems, of which ours is one. That's one of the great blinds, the use of the word seven solar systems, of which ours is one, because it can mean, on some occasions, seven uh, solar, major solar logoi and their stellar expression, or it can mean seven constellations. And it depends on the context uh, that we are using. So for the moment, uh, we will have to add uh, to each one of the signs given yet another sign. Um, we have Aries Libra in connection with the Great Bear, 
uh, could Leo be another uh, sun? We have uh, Gemini Sagittarius uh, connected with the Pleiades. Uh, could um, Virgo be another sign or constellation? We have um, Cancer Capricorn uh, connected with uh, with uh, Sirius. Uh, we wonder uh, could Pisces possibly be another sign? Giving three each and uh, I can't keep it quite straight there's there's one there's one left um, uh, to be connected with the seven solar systems of which ours is one I suppose uh, we have not yet used the constellation Aquarius anyway there are a number of ways of conceiving these nine how shall we conceive these nine. There are justifications for doing it as I have done it, but there's probably also other justifications. Uh, C uh, E A uh, page 50. Okay. So these uh, three major constellations are part of the zodiac with which we are concerned. They are with the seven solar systems, of which ours is one. Are the ten constellations connected with a still greater zodiac, but which is not conditioned by the numerical significance of the number 12. They are conditioned by the more perfect number in a way, uh, conditioned by, by the number 10. Uh, the, it is a more uh, masculine system. Uh, the, the feminine system is conditioned by the number 12. 1 and 2 is 3. 3 represents the mother aspect. The number 1 uh, represents the father aspect. Ten equals one. So in this particular case, seven solar systems of which ours is one, uh, we can think of these systems as uh, super constellations and not as they are given on Esoteric Astrology, page 50. See, I hope I'm, I hope I'm being clear here. At least this is uh, being clear about my speculation. I think there's a lot of blinded language going on here. And that there are lords of individual stars, these lords being associated with our particular solar logos. Uh, our solar logos being one of seven solar systems, of which ours is one. So that's simply a constellation. But... There are also ways of talking about seven solar systems, of which ours is one, and the ours will refer to um, the cosmic logos and its system, um, of which our solar system is a part. And uh, that cosmic logos is just one of seven systems, and there are six other constellational systems consisting of solar logoi. <clears throat> and, and let's say that Draco would be one, and the Little Bear would be one, and the Great Bear would be one. They all have solar logoi within them, but here they would be called, um, well, we have to be careful about including the Great Bear because it's one of the three. But anyway, Draco and Orion and probably some other uh, constellations are part of these seven solar systems. In other words, a constellation is a system. A system is a constellation. This is one way of looking at it. A system is a constellation, or can be, and a constellation can be a system. So that's a blinding language, because sometimes he does refer uh, simply to a solar system as having one star. And yet a system of stars is also a uh, solar system. So anyway, we seem to be looking at a zodiac of um, 10. And in this particular case, um, seven of them are referred to as the seven solar systems, of which our cosmic logoic solar system is one. And we can work out what we think they are. Um, let's just say that uh, uh, Draco will be one of them, uh, the Little Bear will be one, Orion will be one, the so-called uh, uh, system of the cosmic logoic system of which our little star is one, will be one of those 
systems, and there are other constellations which probably are part of these uh, ten. Part of these ten. Okay, they are the ten constellations connected with a still mm, greater zodiac, which is not conditioned by the numerical significance of the number twelve. Um, now, does the uh, the still greater zodiac? Is it a zodiac of 10? Okay, this is what we're trying to see. Hence, 10 is regarded as the number of perfection. So we are, we are speaking of uh, a, uh, probably a 10-fold zodiac, which is in a way superior uh, to our normal uh, 12. 12-fold zodiac. These are great mysteries. Um, as I as I said, uh, Stephen Pugh has done a lot of work on this. I think a lot of uh, very good work uh, opening the subject up to the speculation of uh, students uh, such as we are. But there are still mysteries to be solved here. If you really combine the numbers here, 10 and 12, we get 22. We get the uh, mystical number 22 which is very important to our solar system because our solar system uh, gives a two and two with its second ray soul and its second ray personality. So there's a kind of completeness when we combine these uh, two numbers. Just the way when we combine the number five and the number six, which are half of the numbers we're dealing with, the five for man, in the sixth of the Deva Kingdom, we get the uh, number 11, which gives us the number of the initiate, or the number of Aquarius, or the number of the spiritual hierarchy, or in another way, the number of Gemini. One and one is two. So um, the five is correlated with the 10, the six is correlated with the 12, the 10 is a number of man, and the 12 is a number of the Deva aspect, the feminine aspect. The five, with this five-pointed star, is a number of man. It's more masculine. The six, the six-pointed star is a number related to the Deva aspect and to form. The builders of form relate to the number six. Six is the number of form. It kind of shows us the descent of the circle into matter. And the nine will be um, the reascent of the circle out of matter. Okay. There is confusion in the minds of some of the less learned students astrologically considered on this point. Maybe we can include ourselves, <laughs> including ourselves. Um, the zodiac of 10 and the zodiac of 12. The zodiac of 12 is completely articulated, although some people are trying to make 14 signs or 13 signs, including Ophiuchus and Orion and so forth. But uh, 12 is a heart center, and the zodiac is a heart center within head, and so we should not look for a number that is greater than 12 uh, for our zodiac, I think, um, regardless of how things appear from the constellational perspective. Um, as for filling out every uh, constellation that belongs to the zodiac of 10, I think that still um, remains to be done. Some people have included, for instance, the Southern Cross as representing a kind of base of the spine which is not ascended, with Draco as a base of the spine, and the one about whom Martin said, which has ascended, the Kundalini power which has ascended to the head. Um, there are ways of looking at uh, various associated constellations which we can put into this uh, super category. This is a kind of a tree of life setup. There's the three hovering above the seven, you know, the uh, higher trinity in the tree of life, uh, the, the Kether, the Chokhmah, and the Bina. They are hovering above the lesser seven. And it is, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's related to power. So at least we, we seem to know that the uh, great bear, the Pleiades, or at least part of them, and the constellation Sirius should be the superior three, but if we really think about this and the possible blinding that goes on, 
It may be that the little bear is to take the place of Sirius, and that Sirius is part of a lesser configuration, and is part of a blind whereby a lesser is used to represent a greater. At some point, D.K. talks about the tremendous significance of the triangle of the great bear, little bear, and the Pleiades. And he says it's a stupendous triangle. So, you know, um, it is frequently used that a lesser represents a greater. For instance, in this case, a planet would be used to represent a sign of the zodiac. Or a solar logos, a star, would be used to represent a complete constellation of which it is a part. As is the case when Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, however we want to pronounce it, is used to represent the entirety of Orion. Alcyone could be uh, used to represent the entirety of the Pleiades. Uh, Sirius uh, could be used to represent um, the little bear, although Sirius is not uh, specifically a part of the little bear. All right, these, uh, you know, this is uh, cosmological astrology. It's fascinating. It's dealt with in the great inner departments of hierarchy, uh, the astrological departments, and uh, the crumbs from the tables of the gods are falling off uh, so that we can uh, use them as our full meal. And one day we shall know about these things. And DK has said that cosmic fire, there will be interest in material in cosmic fire in the beginning of the fifth round, and it will be reduced to scientific textbook formation at the end of the fifth round. Well, we're talking millions of years ahead, and the kind of cosmological speculation we're dealing with right now is of uh, equal abstruseness and difficulty to the cosmic fire material. Really, it is cosmic fire material. All right, moving on. It is rather difficult for you also to grasp that the involutionary process for all the kingdoms of nature is related to the passage of the soul, this time the anima mundi, or world soul, from Aries to Pisces via Taurus and not vice versa. Ah, uh, yeah, this is interesting. Um, the, there are three ways, two ways of passing around the, uh, the zodiac, um, or going, moving through the signs, as it were. Uh, three types of beings move through the signs. The anima mundi, the undeveloped individual, and the uh, spiritual individual. And what is being said here is that the method of procedure of the world soul, that, uh, that consciousness which underlies the world of matter particularly, the, the all of the uh, the soul of substance, we might call it the soul of substance, is the same uh, mode of procedure counterclockwise as that uh, along which the spiritual man proceeds. It is only man in his ignorant state that is proceeding in the clockwise manner, as it were, ex the grain. So there's something natural about the anima mundi and something natural. Uh, or right uh, about the mode of procedure of the spiritual man, but when it comes to the ignorant uh, human being who is identified with matter, uh, his uh, individualized uh, consciousness being identified with matter and circumstance, he is proceeding in a clockwise direction, which is against the natural order of things. So let's just say that only man, uh, only ignorant, man proceeds against the natural order of things. In other words, um, there is a, um, a sense in which <clears throat> we are to move developmentally from Aries to Taurus to Gemini and so forth. And when we move backwards, uh, we are in a way uh, moving backward in time and we are representing a kind of uh, even though we're on the path of evolution, we're representing identification with an involutionary order. So DK is right when he says it is rather difficult for us to grasp that the involutionary process for all kingdoms of nature is related to the passage of the soul, the anima mundi, from Aries to Pisces. Um, 
but, but only man goes against the grain, as it were. We are descending into uh, involution as part of a uh, part of an arc. Let's say we're descending into involution, and we are reascending uh, evolutionary in an evolutionary manner. But uh, ignorant uh, man remains identified with that which the anima mundi has provided him. And it takes a long time for him to reverse his uh, direction and begin to uh, progress through the natural order of the signs. The anima mundi on the involutionary arc proceeds this way and not as the personality proceeds. This is, this is very interesting. And Yes, uh, abstruse uh, and difficult to understand why this should be the case. Because the person he is, um, in a way, uh, an involutionary elemental process, uh, which is evolving but still uh, attached to the direction of the uh, involutionary aspects within it. The Anima Mundi passes to Pisces at the close of every great cycle and not to Taurus. So the Anima Mundi is ready to move up and the lives which comprise it are ready to take their next step. It emerges into outer manifestation in Cancer, which is the sign which rules uh, much of matter and elemental life, the sign of mass or group life. It emerges into outer manifestation in Cancer. That's very interesting because so does the mass of humanity. So does the human being on mass emerge in cancer. The sign of mass group life, of mass group activity. Its diffused consciousness has not yet been individualized as has the consciousness of man. So man is in a peculiarly dangerous condition because he has a choice. At first, uh, he moves by instinct in a direction which uh, feeds his elemental nature and whereby his consciousness is controlled by the elemental nature. But later, he has a choice. And if he chooses to continue to uh, uh, work in a reversed, uh, in a retrogressive manner, going clockwise through the signs, then he will have chosen incorrectly and he will uh, condemn his consciousness to captivation by this great uh, Davic life, which uh, substands the uh, dense physical body of the solar logos. He will have to achieve his freedom at some time. He will be uh, a captive of this great Deva. Okay, so the diffused consciousness, which is not self-conscious of the anima mundi, has not yet been individualized as has the consciousness of man. When the world soul, the consciousness underlying substance, when the world soul, after having progressed around the great wheel, reached cancer, and the time came for the fourth creative hierarchy to manifest through the fourth kingdom, as there are other kingdoms through which it can manifest in nature, a reversal took place and then proceeded as now. This is not the same thing as the reversed wheel. The reversed wheel involves reversing the reversal. <laughs> okay, uh, the true uh, reversed wheel involves uh, reversing the reversal. In other words, if we decide to move backwards, which is clockwise, there must come a time when the human being reverses that decision to reverse the natural order. And that second reversal returns the human being to the natural order of the signs. There are many mysteries here. I don't pretend to be able to, to fathom them. DK has told us that we are in no position to really uh, comprehend or feel the nature of the soul of matter, the soul of substance. So he's, uh, he's giving us a general principle here, but it may be a while before we can feel into this. Perhaps some of the great scientific uh, servers who are also psychics can do this. Um, let's see here. We have in the larger issue to consider the influence of the zodiac and the planets upon. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, let's just say, the important thing to realize here is that most human beings are not traveling in a spiritual direction. They're traveling in a direction which emphasizes their elemental nature and which puts their elemental nature in a predominant uh, condition. 
this is um, not uh, leading directly to the unfoldment of their consciousness in a spiritual manner, which uh, requires detachment from the elemental nature. So in a, in a certain way, uh, uh, human beings are going more deeply into matter in a conscious way. They are becoming deeply involved in the periphery of uh, life. They are like the prodigal son who is wandering into a far country and thinking that that far country can offer some type of real uh, satisfaction, which it cannot because man is essentially spirit and he can never be satisfied with that which is less than himself. He needs to return to himself, return to the spirit nature. So uh, we are, in a way, uh, humanity is going in the wrong direction. But it's uh, a direction which is part of the plan because we must invest ourselves deeply in matter substance before we can redeem it. Uh, is this the way things happen on other planets? Does that which is man on another planet go more and more deeply into uh, matter before extricating itself? Well, we know that... Um, there is no such suffering in the solar system as there is upon Earth, and there is great suffering upon Mars and Saturn as well, but on the other planets not. So perhaps it has something to do with this retrogressive, redemptive movement. A necessary, apparently, a necessary retrogressive movement whereby we invest ourselves in the not-self in order to redeem that not-self. Ultimately, we know that everything is the one-self, and that one-self is the absolute an infinite self, but, um, you know, from planet to planet there are distinctions, and we as human beings are, in a way, going in the wrong direction considering how old we are. We are old enough to begin waking up and to reverse our direction, so we have to reverse the reversal. That's one way of thinking about it. Now, going on, let's see how we're doing uh, in our experiment to make a somewhat longer webinar, which will save time in the long run. Uh, it will save those interludes of time and allow me to speak to you uh, during times when I would normally be having to find something else to do while conversion work is going on. Okay, um, we have in the larger issue to consider the influence of the zodiac and the planets upon. We're going to look at different beings upon which the zodiac and planets uh, will have an influence, the spirit of the earth. This is the embodiment of the physical planet and the sum total of the form life in all the kingdoms of nature. These are the expression of the anima mundi or the world soul. Now, uh, we're, are we dealing strictly with dense physical matter here? Uh, the matter of the lower three systemic subplanes, or are we dealing, uh, or is this uh, related to the dense physical body of the planetary logos, which would include astral matter and lower mental matter? Because all of those, uh, uh, all of those substances are considered to be uh, involutionary from the point of view of the principal nature of our planetary logos. In other words, the lower 18 subplanes are for the planetary logos and not a principal. They're not part of the program uh, in this second solar system. They are to be redeemed, but they're not uh, carrying uh, a patterning power, which is uh, closely uh, related to the will of the uh, planetary logos. And we can say the same for the solar logos. Whoops. <laughs> okay. That's my little camera there. So uh, the zodiac and the planets work upon the spirit of the earth, which is uh, an involutionary entity, the embodiment of the physical planet, and we have to define this term, physical planet. Define this term as either the lower three subplanes of the systemic uh, physical plane or the lower 18 subplanes mm, um, consisting of the 
in the etheric, physical, astral, and lower mental systemic subplanes. All right, so it has a, an effect upon an involutionary entity called the spirit of the earth, or sometimes called the planetary entity. Let me look up the word, uh, let me look up the word spirit of the earth. Uh, it, it's not always the same as planetary spirit, because when we say the spirit of the earth, um, we usually mean this involutionary entity. When we say planetary spirit, we can often mean the planetary logos uh, himself. So let's just see um, how this works. Okay. And we'll try to make this a little bit bigger. Yes. One seven five. Okay, and take this down. All these little adjustments that have to be made when one signs off. So let's take a look. Spirit of the Earth. There are twenty-five references to it. Uh, connection with the spirit of the Earth. Yes, and the physical plane. A mysterious synthesis connected with the spirit of the Earth. It is the physical plane here, as we see. The planetary entity, spirit of the earth, is the planetary entity, not the planetary logos, but the planetary spirit has a different meaning. Spirit of the earth is the plan. Aha! Look at this. The spirit of the earth is to the planetary logos of the earth, for instance, what the personality of form nature is to the soul of man. So, the um, the, the personality nature of the planetary logos would be included. Therefore, the astral and lower mental planes would be included in this case. Okay, and the spirit of the earth, the embodiment of the physical planet, and the sum total of form life in all kingdoms, is subservient to Venus. Uh, well, even the, plan even the planetary spirit is subservient to Venus. The mysterious entity we call the spirit of the earth is on the evolutionary arc, and is to our planet what the physical elemental is to the physical uh, body of man. So... Um, Yes, the, uh, this is that involutionary entity called the physical elemental. It seems to organize the physical matter uh, in the physical body of man. And so we would extend this to the planet as well. The spirit of the earth, um, the relation of the planetary logos to the spirit of the earth, the relation of an evolutionary being to an involutionary entity is reflection, distorted and under the influence of glamour, in the three worlds of the relation of the soul to the personality elemental. Okay, it's distorted. I think we get the idea. Now let's look at the word planetary spirit, of which there are 15 references. Um, yes, planetary spirit is a higher entity. Uh, on his vaster scale and on his own high level, this planetary spirit is learning to live, learning to contact and expand his consciousness. Okay to the great planetary spirit, something wider still. Back of the light, this is all in the consciousness of the atom, perhaps we'll see. The nameless one on the confines of the high planes of human evolution and the planetary spirit himself at the final stage. It is high. The planetary spirit is high and represents uh, even the monadic nature of the solar logos, uh, of, of the planetary logos. So the difference between uh, the spirit of the earth and planetary entity, they are the same. Spirit of the earth and planetary entity and planetary spirit, which is the Logos himself. Okay, so the zodiac and the planets uh, affect this uh, spirit of the earth. Or let's, uh, let's give him his other name here. Planetary entity. And it's like a kind of a physical elemental, but it's also been related to other elementals, personality elementals, uh, in relation to the greater planetary logos. They affect humanity as a whole. And the individualized and finally initiated man. This is the embodiment of the human soul or ego. Uh, a differentiation of the world soul. See, in other words, in a way, in a way, and this is important, we uh, as individualized uh, uh, human beings are part of the animal mundi. We are a differentiated aspect of the world soul. We, uh, because if we say world soul, we have to understand 
what particular level of substance we are talking about. Usually we are talking about um, the embodiment of uh, substance. And so we're talking about a type of consciousness which is not yet individualized, but the world is a big place, and the world includes the higher, um, the higher levels where individualization holds sway. So we, the human ego, are a differentiation of the world soul, which expresses itself as a personality, a correspondence to the spirit of the planet, not the planetary spirit. Personality is a correspondence to the spirit of the planet. And finally, as a spiritual soul, a correspondence to the planetary logos. So the zodiac, uh, what's the important thing here? The energies of the zodiac and the energies of the planets are affecting uh, conscious, self-conscious entities and entities which have not yet uh, achieved self-consciousness. They are also affecting super-conscious entities who see and understand in wholes. Okay. Now, uh, we would be reaching the point at which we would normally say the Great Invocation, but we're going to go on and see if we can extend this uh, a little bit. The uh, energies of the Zodiac and the energies of the planets also affect the Lord of the planet, one of the great lives or sons of God, at present regarded as an imperfect God. Our planetary logos is here indicated, and he is an imperfect God because he is thus far only an initiate of the first degree cosmically considered. He may be passing through a kind of fourth initiation, but that's a subsidiary uh, uh, initiation. It's in a subsidiary sequence of initiations. Cosmically, he has not yet achieved the goal of the second uh, cosmic initiation. So the Lord of our planet, one of the great lives or sons of God, at present regarded as an imperfect God as far as our planet is concerned, and yet from the angle of humanity, perfect indeed. Uh, Sanat Kumara does not fully express all that the planetary logos is, and we regard Sanat Kumara in the most superlative terms. So it's all relative here, and uh, perfection uh, has to be considered in a relative way compared to the condition of the human being, our planetary logos uh, still higher than Sanakumara, Sanakumara being an, an emanation of him, is perfect indeed. So these are three spheres uh, upon which our zodiac and planets play. They play upon the unconscious sphere, the not yet self-conscious sphere. They play upon the self-conscious sphere, and they play upon the superconscious sphere, and they have uh, emanating as they do these energies from very high cosmic lores, uh, they have differential effects depending upon the form that they touch. This is constantly to be understood that we cannot so much gauge uh, cosmic energies, the nature of them in themselves, but what we can do is see the effect they have upon the different forms which they condition. Right now we're interested in the conditioning of the self-conscious human being who is moving towards group consciousness and eventually towards consciousness of the one, which is, uh, in a way, super consciousness. The above triple division expresses the three major aspects of the ancient and esoteric science of astrology, how it works on lesser lives, uh, middling lives, and super lives, the ancient and esoteric science of astrology, and its three divisions as the hierarchy studies them, and hierarchical members are assigned to these different levels. There are some who are working with the soul of substance, with um, soul in its uh, unself-conscious stage. Humanity, having lost the consciousness, I guess it once had it, which permits contact with the spirit of the planet, subhuman consciousness, Subhuman, human, superhuman, that's one way of looking at it. And which was the basis of animism. How interesting that uh, those human beings who ascribe to animism feel the soul within substance. And having not yet developed the consciousness which permits him to enter into the life and mind of the planetary logos, 
has dealt only with the second division, that of uh, uh, the human consciousness, that of self-consciousness, and even self-consciousness in its lower aspects. So uh, humanity is quite blind, quite ignorant. Humanity quite blind and ignorant of the different phases of the world soul. The lower and uh, the higher middling and the highest. Humanity is ignorant of all of those. We are just uh, aware of the lower middling reaches of soul in the realm of self-consciousness. All right, well, this is uh, this would be normally the end of Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 52, but instead uh, I will continue as best I can, and uh, thereby preserving, preserving time. All right, now we will continue. We have in a way reached the end of Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 52, part 1. And we will see whether GoToWebinar allows me to continue to the two-hour level. Um, I think downloads will not be so slow, so you will be able to use these conveniently. We'll see how I see whether I feel, whether I can push on to a three-hour segment. We will see. Um, so we're continuing. Two other points might be touched upon. And for their understanding, you will have to accept my statement as temporary hypotheses at least, for you are in no position to know them as truth for yourselves. Well, sad to say, but this is the a true condition of human ignorance. We are in no position to verify maybe 95% of what the Tibetan tells us. Um, he is... Um, he is a master of the wisdom. He has profound perception. Uh, the cities of various kinds have opened up for him. And uh, we are in the position, in many respects, of trusting students who can uh, follow his authoritative statements as hypotheses. We can see, uh, eventually, prove these things for ourselves. But for the moment, it seems to be the part of wisdom to um, assume that since he has been correct in so many uh, of the statements he has made, he is probably uh, correct, or mostly correct, probably totally correct, in giving in, in those statements which we cannot possibly verify. Not yet. But we're on our way, and uh, towards the later phases of the evolutionary process, it is possible to uh, make a rapid progress into the expansion of perception. So um, many of us are reaching that stage now, having uh, labored long and hard through many lesser stages of consciousness. We are in no position to know the truth for ourselves, he says. Exoteric astrology has said, and it is widely accepted that Vulcan, Uranus, Pluto, and Neptune do not govern signs, but have an affinity with them. Well, okay, um, I think Alan Leo can say that. Um, and uh, there, are, there are many who accept that Uranus is the ordinary ruler of Aquarius, but it used to be Saturn, didn't it? Vulcan was not known, Pluto was not discovered, and only recently Alan Leo said Neptune is the ruler of Pisces. So there are probably indeed many exoteric astrologers who have not considered these uh, uh, more remote planets, and in one case uh, an undiscovered planet, to have uh, no rulership over any of the signs. I'm touching upon this here because we are going to consider the planet Pluto in relation to Pisces. Now remember this book is written in the early 30s, and uh, Pluto uh, was discovered in 1930, so the Tibetan was authorized to speak of it because mankind had discovered it, although it was, they say, recorded on a film as early as, 1990, and early as 1915, but not recognized. So Pluto discovered in 1930, coincided with this 
mass uh, <clears throat> uprising of negativity which uh, Nazism and that type of fascism represented. Okay, <clears throat> this affinity has only uh, stated a partial truth and is only temporarily true from the standpoint of the modern astrologer. I think he's saying that indeed these planets do rule signs, but they rule them from a more esoteric perspective. Um, the existence of these planets, right, their existence has only been inferred or discovered within the last two or three centuries, though it has always been known to the hierarchy. So the hierarchy, uh, capital H, has known the secret planets. And there are many other planets right now, completely undiscovered by humanity, which hierarchy knows about and which are responsible for many of the pushes and pulls which we experience even now. We don't know where they come from and we attribute these influences to incorrect sources or to sources which we presently know about when they really come from other unknown sources. I have indicated to you the signs of which they are the rulers and the astrology of the future will accept my statement and work with these planets. Okay, so, you know, Pluto being the ruler of Pisces, esoteric and hierarchically, Uranus the ruler of Aquarius, that much everybody accepts, but also the esoteric ruler of Libra and the hierarchical ruler of Aries and the veiled hierarchical ruler of Leo. Uh, Neptune being the esoteric and hierarchical ruler of um, Cancer and the veiled hierarchical, uh, veiled esoteric ruler. Um, Leo, and also uh, in a special category in relation to Pisces. And Vulcan being the esoteric and hierarchical ruler of um, Taurus, and the veiled hierarchical ruler, one of them, no, excuse me, the veiled esoteric ruler of Virgo, along with Neptune. Neptune, another veiled esoteric ruler of Virgo. And then, um, when we get into Aquarius, uh, Vulcan, Neptune, and Uranus are all veiled hierarchical rulers. So ancient astrology was obviously incomplete, except as the hierarchy understood it. But until man becomes patently responsive to the influences which come to him from Uranus and Pluto, for instance, which affect the soul life far more than they do the personality life. Because, you know, even though it's a non-sacred planet, Pluto, even though non-sacred planet, non-sacred planet, Pluto is considered an esoteric planet. So uh, he's telling us that this non-sacred planet, Pluto, affects the soul life more than it does the personality life and that only when a person is truly on the path are the influences of Pluto, I suppose the spiritual influences, uh, registered. As for Uranus, we can well uh, agree. So um, until a man becomes patently, noticeably more responsive to the influence which comes to him from Uranus, Uranus and Pluto, they remain undiscovered except by trained esotericists, undiscovered in consciousness, uh, in consciousness. But uh, from another point of view, man was progressing, and it was only, um, uh, it was only in recent centuries that man became patently more responsive to these influences as a whole, and so they were discovered. Now, for many people, they're not discovered in consciousness. They mean nothing in terms of the a process of life and consciousness process, but man as a whole became uh, more responsive uh, to these influences, and therefore uh, his responsiveness, man's responsiveness, humanity's responsiveness, enabled their discovery, even though there are many human beings for whom uh, they mean psychologically, spiritually, nothing yet. Uh, though they can affect the outer elemental life. Remember that uh, uh, the planets can affect the subhuman parts of ourselves, the non-self-conscious parts of ourselves, the substantial aspects of ourselves. 
They remained undiscovered except by trained esotericists who are members of the hierarchy. Today, humanity is rapidly responding to the higher spiritual influences, and therefore, we can look for the discovery of increasingly subtle forces. So, uh, let's just say that Vulcan uh, and more planets are about to be discovered because uh, humanity is more uh, responsive. Uh, and I, I, I guess I, I would say, discovered, I would say uh, that when the spiritual will of humanity really begins to assert itself, and people look at our uh, dreadful uh, method of relating with each other and say, enough is enough, and now we will have to have a method of relating this world which is based more upon the spiritual will and upon principles, then Vulcan, the planet of spiritual will, uh, will be discovered. When humanity learns to stand with massed intent for the good, then Vulcan will be discovered. Just as in the period uh, when the revolutionary fervor was sweeping through humanity, Uranus was discovered, and when the uh, cult was coming into vogue and anesthesia uh, was making its appearance in medicine and uh, awareness of mediumship was uh, uh, becoming uh, popular in the in the consciousness neptune was discovered and with the mass eruption of the uh, subterranean forces which could be considered to represent the black lodge in many respects pluto was discovered so when the quality sweeps through humanity the quality which relates to a planet sweeps through human action and human consciousness, then that which is the related but thus far undiscovered planet will be discovered. Okay, so there's a lot more going on, and as I've often said, we astrologers, we're, just, uh, we're not playing with a, a full deck. We're not playing with a full deck of cards, and many are the sources of uh, influence, of which we are unaware. We cannot yet control our stars. We cannot even identify all of them. But we can become increasingly sensitive to and discriminate influences uh, affecting our lives, even though we may not know the sources of those influences. And if we remain sensitive and begin to differentiate these influences, then perhaps uh, discovery will come. Just imagine the day when some 115 plus planets will be uh, known to uh, to humanity it will be a day of uh, a type of computing power uh, which will entirely dwarf the sophisticated computing power we have at the present time and we will be able to isolate those influences learn of their nature gradation and timing and uh, negotiate this web of energies in a far more intelligent, plan-centered manner than is presently possible. Well, well, we made it. Uh, <laughs> somewhere in uh, tape uh, or program number 52, we made it through Aries. The first sign of the zodiac, and he has told us uh, important things, uh, which we will have to identify keynotes, keywords, those nine points to be identified in when studying all the others. And I want to take a quick look here. Um, I used to have it. I know that on page, approximately page 119, um, no, that would be, I can't do that. 119, I believe, of esoteric astrology or so. Yes, he does deal with the two ways of going around the <clears throat> mutable cross. And I'm wondering if around page 143, yes, he does. That's, in 143, he also identifies um, ways of uh, progressing on the fixed cross. He doesn't do this for the cardinal cross. So these are some of the ways we can compare the signs by going to these particular uh, tabulations. Okay, now we're about to enter into the sign Pisces. You see, we are going backwards. We are 
going in the direction of um, spiritually ignorant, individualized man. We're not going in the direction of the anima mundi. We're not going in the counterclockwise direction of spiritual man. We are still, uh, the Tibetan is making a point here. And even though he's talking about these signs in ways which are certainly uh, spiritual, he is progressing backwards, what we would consider backwards, to arrest our attention so that we can realize that the, there are two wheels operating, a wheel of form, personality, and a wheel of consciousness, soul. We have to fix this uh, in our minds. And this is part of the new astrology so we can understand uh, what is the reversal of the wheel for the human being and understand how human evolution is meant to take place and help ourselves and others to progress in a counterclockwise manner, responding in our form to the higher spiritual potentials of these signs and not the ordinary substantial, elemental, personal, selfish response. All right, Pisces the fishes. From page 115 to 134. Pisces, the fishes. Aries was a dual sign and it represents the life power coming forth and uh, like a fountain and going to the right and going to the going to the right and going to the left. Uh, it's unity uh, entering into the world of duality in a way. You, you could look at Aries as coming down and splitting like this, the horns of the ram. Instead of rising in this way, we could learn see it descending and splitting like this. It would be more like the horns of the ram. But anyway, unity enters the world of duality uh, in Aries. It has a unity of root and a, a, a dual, uh, a bifurcation at the uh, uppermost or bottommost part of the symbol. This sign is also dual. In Aries, we have the duality which is attached to the bringing together of spirit and matter in the great creative activity. Remember, creation is one of the keynotes of Aries, the great creative activity. Um, is attached to the bringing together of spirit and matter. This is not just um, soul and personality. Those are a pair of opposites and a very important pair of opposites for the present human being. And perhaps the opposites of spirit and matter are a little more out of reach, though they are in reach for the initiates. So Aries is associated with the highest and lowest meeting, the first ray, the seventh ray, spirit and matter. In the great creative activity of manifestation at the beginning of the evolutionary cycle. Well, when is that? For man, en masse, it begins 21 million years ago. But what is the beginning of the evolutionary cycle? Is it um, when our solar logos uh, took form with his planets? Let us say, let us keep it microcosmic and talk about uh, the beginning of man. And every life, in a way, is a continuation and a renewed beginning of man's long evolutionary cycle. Whilst in Pisces, we have the fusion or blending of soul and form, as far as man is concerned, soul and form, consciousness and substance, as far as man is concerned, producing the manifestation of the incarnated Christ, the perfected individual soul, the completed manifestation of the microcosm. So Pisces uh, is the sign, in one way, most associated with Christ. Pisces is most associated with the Christ consciousness. Now at the present time, it is Virgo, the sign opposite Pisces, which brings in more of, this, of the second ray than any other sign at this particular time. And Virgo uh, has much to do with the birth, the gestation, and following birth of the Christ consciousness. But Pisces is a cosmic decanate. 
Exactly what that means, we cannot tell, but there are three signs which are cosmic decanates, or three constellations, that's Taurus, uh, Scorpio, and Pisces. And each one of the great world teachers is associated with one of these cosmic decanates, Hercules with uh, Scorpio, Buddha with Taurus, and uh, Christ with Pisces. So the fullest flowering of the second ray can be looked to in Pisces. It is the sign most pervaded by the second ray of love, wisdom, but that in a very high sense. Gemini is another second ray sign, Virgo the other, but finally it is Pisces with which our present Christ is most identified and which most um, reveals or expresses the Christ consciousness. So Pisces brings together soul and form rather than spirit and matter. In a way, it's more on the soft line uh, of energy. And Pisces expresses the second ray and the sixth ray at this present time, though it's very much connected with third ray substance, water, or matter. Um, soul and form, uh, even form, is not particularly related to the third ray it, uh, and matter because form results from a second ray building activity utilizing the substances of matter. And soul, of course, is consciousness and represents the second aspect. So both soul and form, though in different dimensions, are uh, related to the second ray. Whereas Aries is a major first ray sign, and this rays are one and seven hardline rays. These are um, rays at present expressing. As I've tried to indicate, I believe that every sign of the zodiac, every constellation, has every ray, just the way our little planet has every ray. But there are certain emphases at certain times. Now, what DK does not give us, he tells us that certain rays express through certain constellations, but he does not assign these rays to the periodical vehicles of the Lord, lords of the constellations. When it comes to the Earth, he gives it a first ray monad, second ray soul, third ray personality. So the rays which uh, Earth is uh, emitting, shall we say, um, these rays are assigned to periodical vehicles, the monad, soul, uh, causal body, and the personality are per periodical vehicles. But not so with the, uh, the periodical vehicles of the lords of the constellation, but just given the rays. And we would have to ourselves determine if the rays that are expressing through uh, these great beings are in fact uh, periodic, uh, conditioning their periodical vehicles. In other words, does Aries in some way have a first ray conditioning one of its periodical vehicles, namely, uh, namely its monad, its, uh, its egoic body, or its personality. Is Aries a first-ray monadic cosmic lord? Is it a second-ray monadic cosmic lord? Is the lamb slain from the foundations of the world? Does it have uh, uh, the sixth ray or the third ray uh, conditioning one of its vehicles? Because we're given only two rays passing through Aries, at least at this time, and there are three periodical vehicles. So, in the same way that a human being has a five-fold, even six-fold ray chart, it seems reasonable to conclude that a planetary logos also has a six-fold ray chart, and that a solar logos the same, and that a constellational lord also has a six-fold ray chart. But that would enter into the realm of too much complexity but one day I think we will be able to discover why the qualities of a constellational lord are what they are by examining a fuller ray chart than we are given. Actually, we're given no ray chart at all for these uh, lords of constellations, but we are given rays and we can perhaps attempt to assign some of these rays to periodical vehicles. Okay, so the fusion under the second ray primarily of soul and form. In, in one way, soul is ruled generically by the second ray and formed by the sixth ray, the two rays that are passing through Pisces as they are through Virgo. The blending of soul and form as far as man is concerned, we're working microcosmically, 
and producing the manifestation of the incarnated Christ, the Christ within man, the fully flowering soul, the perfected individual soul, let's call it a fully flowering soul. That's what we are looking at. Thus, the greater and the lesser polar opposites, the human being and God, the microcosm and the macrocosm are brought to their destined expression and manifestation. Well, uh, the greater of the polar opposites, uh, the greater of the polar opposites is, we can imagine, spirit and matter. The lesser of the polar opposites, uh, in a certain way, we can consider soul and form. So we have the human being and we have God. God, in this case, seems to be related to Aries, God the Father of the human being, in this case, more to Pisces, the individual human fish swimming in the great ocean of matter, water, and the dense, uh, the lower uh, planes of the solar logos and planetary logos. They are brought to their destined expression and manifestation. We, from a practical point of view, we should be most interested in bringing the individual Christ within our nature to the right form of expression. That is our immediate task. We cannot worry so much about the planetary Christ or the solar systemic Christ or the cosmic Christ. These will be handled by the entities uh, uh, who uh, work at those levels. Until man is nearing the goal, these words mean but little. What does it mean to near the goal? Well, perhaps to begin taking the first initiation, to enter in some small way the kingdom of God. Perhaps that means nearing the goal. Uh, and there are other and higher goals. Uh, maybe DK means something even closer to the fourth initiation. But entering the uh, kingdom of God is uh, in a way nearing the goal. And... For many first-degree initiates, these books are written, so maybe we can begin to understand just a little bit. Until man is nearing the goal, these words mean but little. Though study of the sign Pisces in the two ways intended, i.e. on the wheel of form and the wheel of consciousness, may reveal much that is significant and suggestive. You know, in a way, Pisces is a kind of beginning and a kind of end, just as Aries is. And one day, Aries Pisces will be one sign. Pisces. Uh, a kind of beginning and end. There's a certain sense of finality, and uh, we are told about Pisces go forth into matter, uh, the very first incarnation in individual sense, as we have been seeing, DK says, is taken in Pisces. And the final incarnation, which will bring a man to Shambhala, is often experienced in Pisces. So, like Aries, it is a kind of beginning and end. The goal of deity, the emergence of God's plan, and the nature of his eternal purpose is for us only a subject of interested speculation. Is DK including himself here? Uh, perhaps uh, when it comes to fathoming the eternal purpose of God, DK is including himself. Uh, DK tells us that he has not been to the cosmic astral plane, is not qualified to speak about that which transpires there, except in a very learned sense, maybe not in a direct experiential sense. He can say something about the emergence of God's plan because he, like the other masters, is part of that emergence. But as for the unknown, unheard purpose of uh, Sanat Kumara, the seven great purposes of Sanat Kumara, there are some purposes which Sanat Kumara keeps entirely to himself. He does not give these purposes yet to one whose rank is that of the master. Maybe the master is understanding something like the first syllable of Sanat Kumara's name. This is the first letter or first syllable, I think, maybe the first syllable of Sanat Kumara's name. Anyway, with every increase in initiatory rank of letter, a syllable, more than one syllable of the great name of Sanat Kumara is revealed, and along with that, the purpose. So if it is speculative for Master DK, it's certainly speculative for us, interested speculation, the goal of deity. We're given in a general sense the idea that, that our deity is to become a great station of light uh, within the solar system. The theme of our planetary logos is light and 
illumination. When it comes to the goal of the solar logos, we understand that he is a heart center and a cosmic logos, so increasingly the energy of uh, Buddhic love will have to be expressed through our uh, solar logos, but that doesn't really tell us so much, that he will become a greater and greater god of love, a consuming fire of love. It tells us something and gives us the idea that love must condition everything within the solar system, but the specifics of the purpose are not revealed. And the way he goes about achieving them in relation to other aspects of the cosmic logos of which he is a part are not revealed. The goal of deity, the emergence of God's plan, and the nature of his eternal purpose is for us only a subject of interested speculation. There is a possibility that this plan, the divine plan and purpose, uh, of whether of the planetary logos or solar logos, may be vastly different, may be vastly different to our surmise, which is based upon our formulation of a deity who is the product of our mental processes and of devoted idealism. Two of the three aspects of the personality nature. We have mentality, we have a devoted idealism, at least the high person does, relatively high. And we may speculate upon the nature of, of our deity, of our planetary logos, of our solar logos. Uh, you know, sometimes to speculate upon the nature of the absolute God is, is utterly futile when we realize that we cannot even do so for our planetary logos, uh, our solar logos. So uh, DK is uh, warning us that our conceptions may be very much other than truth. The product of our mental processes and devoted idealism, two of the three aspects of the personality nature, and the attempt to interpret his infinite purposes in terms of our own finiteness. Well, okay, um, which God are we talking about? Because a planetary God or a solar God cannot have, strictly speaking, infinite purposes. But let us say that, uh, well, for that matter, I think that even the uh, universal God of our uh, cosmos cannot have infinite purposes because the cosmos is a one. It's a unity. It is delimited. It is not a many. It is a, a particular singularity. Uh, it is not the infinity of infinities. So, when, uh, you know, maybe I'm too particular about this word infinite. Not that I can say I really understand it, but it is a passion of mine. So sometimes it's just meant to indicate a very large number, a, a, a number which we couldn't possibly count because given our human limitations, we, we, could not, uh, we could not spend the time counting it. We could not find a way to count it. But uh, here we are, the idea is that uh, we in our own little personality nature cannot attempt to understand the vast purposes of the deities in whom we live and move and have our being, namely our planetary logos, our solar logos, and logoi beyond. So let us always remember this. And so what is this here, really? This is an injunction to humility and uh, right proportion. And humility is an adjusted sense of right proportion. The mechanism for divine perception, the higher cities, have not yet developed in the human family on any large scale, though some have it, and some have some, and is only achieving some measure of usefulness in the initiative of the third degree. So when we are initiated of the third degree, the Ajna center uh, is awakening to fuller power. The center in the center of the head, the, the etheric third eye is awakening and the higher cities are gaining the possibility of expression. So, the initiative of the third degree has some degree. Uh, the initiative of the third degree uh, has some uh, divine perception. Now, this is not just spiritual perception. Think of it. Spiritual perception is uh, inaccessible enough. You know, spiritual perception has to do with the realms of the soul and of the spiritual triad. Divine perception is relating to still higher levels. The higher two subplanes of the Buddhic plane, the higher two subplanes of the ethnic plane, and modes of perception which are uncategorized and which are characteristic of the monadic plane or logoic plane. Those are the, really the divine levels of perception. So only the very high initiate will have them. He's talking about sensitivity here, really, isn't he? I mean, Pisces is a sign of uh, 
great sensitive consciousness. And so it seems right for him to be discussing our limitations and the possibilities of our eventual uh, growing sensitivity when discussing this sign of impression, of mediation, and uh, in a lesser sense of mediumship. This is a very receptive sign, uh, a sign which is maybe so easy to be overwhelmed by circumstance and many lesser energies, but which, uh, when those places are overcome, can attune with high and subtle energies which for most people uh, seem non-existent. Okay. How are we doing here? We are speaking of a duality in Pisces. We've been talking about the uh, bringing together of uh, soul and form. Okay, um, soul and form. The duality of Pisces must be studied in relation to its three keynotes. So DK is, has promised giving us the keynotes and key words of the sign of Pisces. Bondage or captivity. This is the initial phase. This is the whale swallowing Jonah, the whale of great size. It is Cetus, the sea monster. It's related to the Hydra. It's related to the, um, the uh, deluge of elemental forces, which can easily overcome a human being who has not yet uh, stabilized himself in the spiritual consciousness. Bondage or captivity, we are subject to many influences in the lower worlds. Renunciation or detachment. And um, here we are learning to give up our attachment to these or, uh, influences. Uh, we put them aside, we repulse them, perhaps under the law of repulse, the fourth law of the soul. And we can observe them but find that we are not swayed by them. And finally, when we have detached ourselves from that which originally kept us in bondage and captivity, we learn to uh, sacrifice any possible desire for those levels. We make a sacred offering. We give up what most uh, people cherish because we cherish something still higher, and we die to the lower worlds and are, in a way, uh, born into still higher areas of opportunity. So it's not a very sad and sort of gruesome death, but great hope and possibility. Pisces being a sign of great hope. Great hope follows the stage and realization. Okay, so these are the keynotes. Bondage or captivity, renunciation or detachment. Pluto certainly helps with that, right? Now, uh, interestingly, that uh, bondage uh, can relate to Jupiter and Neptune, two of the rulers of Pisces, because one is uh, thoroughly engaged with all this lower level of expression. Uh, and finally, sacrifice and death. Certainly, Pluto is the planet of death, and uh, it cuts the thread which binds us to lesser things. So the rulers of Pisces, Jupiter and Pluto, are very much involved in this process. Interesting that Pisces uh, rules very large animals, such as whales, of all things, whereas Virgo rules small animals in es exoteric astrology. And the whale of great size is a very Jupiterian, Neptunian thing. It's in the Neptunian waters, and it's of great size. It's Jupiter. And it engulfs and swallows and incorporates the soul uh, for a long time, thus keeping it in bondage. So remember that not every, well every planet is wonderful it's a planetary god but there are uh, negative ways in which these planets can express according to the type of form that it influences so there are some lower expressions of the planets and you know every time we mention aquarius we can't say oh that's a wonderful sign everything's good about aquarius we have to remember that the nazi party came into power in germany uh, as the official ruling party under aquarius on january 30th um, so, uh, the, the signs of the Zodiac, um, their qualities are not all good, not all bad. It 
depends on how they are used. That's a truism, but we have to keep it in mind. Otherwise, we will always go on preferring uh, Aquarius to Pisces or preferring the seventh ray to the sixth ray uh, or pre preferring the second ray to the third ray, not realizing that they are all equally divine and that there are negative expressions of even the rays we prefer and the signs that we prefer. Okay, page 116. In the first cycle of experience upon the wheel, turning clockwise, I would assume, the soul itself is in captivity to substance. It's all that the consciousness sees. It's not sensitive to any of the uh, inner uh, impulses yet. It is impressionable to all the outer impulses. And they sway the soul and lead the soul and compel the soul. You, you've seen uh, some of these people, they look like they are cut adrift and any um, current that comes along from the uh, normal worlds uh, sways them and directs them. They, they are not self-directing. Let's just talk about that here. Uh, not self-directing individuals. It has come down into the prison house of matter. The soul has come down to the prison house of matter. Pisces is the 12th sign. It represents the 12th house. And typically uh, prisons, places of incarceration, even uh, convents and monasteries where you are in a way uh, voluntarily incarcerated, they are all ruled by the 12th house. Asylums, institutions, even hospitals where you are confined. Places of confinement. Uh, albeit for the purpose of redemption, but nevertheless, places of confinement are ruled by Pisces and uh, relate to the 12th house. The soul has come down into the prison house of matter and linked itself to form. Those are the ties, the, 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 uh, the magnetic ties, and uh, those are the very ties which Pluto has to cut. Magnetic ties. Uh, it, it dissociates itself from what was previously so appealing. You know, uh, through the eye of glamour, uh, many essentially worthless things appear very appealing. So we are trying to uh, understand that and to eventually achieve our detached freedom. Uh, hence the symbol of Pisces of the two fishes linked together by a band. This is the magnetic band, and it's also considered to be one of the constellations magnetic band of uh, the, the constellations associated with Pisces. Um, Andromeda, Cepheus the king, and the band, the band binding the two fishes together. Uh, is it true that um, uh, the Buddha had uh, Pisces on the ascendant? There's some writings by D.K. that seem to indicate this, along with his Taurus sun and his Scorpio moon. Maybe it is so. But anyway, the, the Buddha came to cut that band, and he was able to use Scorpio to do it, and also the brilliant light of Taurus to do it, to dissolve the band which binds the fish of the soul to the fish of form, the vertical fish to the horizontal fish. When you, when you look at Pisces, you see that the two fishes are swimming in two different directions. One is uh, vertical and the other is more horizontal, representing, in this case, the world of form. So the two fishes are linked together by a band. One fish stands for the soul and the other for the personality of form nature, and between them can be found the thread or sutrachma, the silver cord, which keeps them bound together to each other, bound to each other throughout the cycle of manifested life. Well, that may be one that is one thread that one wants to be very judicious in cutting. There are other threads that one can cut. Um, eventually, finally, the Sutratma is cut, but only after all has been accomplished. If we cut the Sutratma prematurely, we cut away our possibility of working out the purposes of soul in form. But there are um, threads of consciousness, which in a way, or threads of attachment at least, which have to be cut. One can remain consciousness, uh, conscious of that to which one is 
no longer attached. Um, so anyway, the the thread or sutratna, the band, represents the silver core. Sometimes silver, maybe another color. DK says it's not exactly an apt description, but there is a magnetic cord of life that connects the two fishes and death. Uh, followed at the end of every incarnation is the cutting of the cord under Pluto so that the consciousness returns to itself and is no longer engaged uh, with the previous form. You can ask yourself, well, what was the form of my previous life or, or five lives previously? Do I really care? I only care in as much as it may affect my consciousness now. But am I attached to those previous uh, uh, physical via per se or the, the previous etheric substance, am I attached to those atoms? Probably I am not, although I am attached to the elemental lives which are generated through my permanent atoms. I remain attached to those until the fourth initiation. Later on, upon the reverse wheel, the personality is brought into captivity by the soul. Well, the man swallows the whale, <laughs> in a certain sense. Uh, uh, the, the, the personality is reduced in its influence, and the soul waxes and grows, as in Gemini. And the elemental life is no longer allowed to do precisely what it wants to do. No longer. But for long eons, the situation is reversed, and the soul is the prisoner of the personality. Well, let us say that our consciousness is the victim of all of these uh, fire, earth, air, and water, fire by friction, elemental lives. And this is the case for the majority of human beings. The soul as the prisoner of the personality. This dual bondage... Uh, Pisces being a dual sign, the sign of bondage or of binding to, is brought to an end by what is called the final death. It makes you think that Pluto is involved there, and maybe Uranus on the final burning ground. The, the, the relationship of human awareness to form is uh, and a form uh, in bondage uh, to the human awareness is finally terminated at the highest stages of human initiation, when the complete release of the life aspect from the life of form takes place. Mm, there is a... Um, mm, this is uh, much later in the process. And there is, uh, in esoteric healing, a rule, um, a final... Uh, a final law. Is it law number 10 in esoteric healing? Let's take a look at that if we can. And let's see. Um, law 10. Maybe here. Oh yes, this is it. Um, this is it. This is the final liberation. And it says, um, these are two forms of death. Um, hearken, O Chela, to the call, which comes from the son to the mother and then obey. The word goes forth that form has served its purpose. This principle of mind then organizes itself and then repeats the word. The waiting form responds and drops away. The soul stands free. So this is the freedom. This is the temporary cutting of the consciousness from the life of form at the end of every uh, incarnation. But look at the next part of the law. Respond, O rising one. This is the spirit itself, the monad. Respond, O rising one, to the call which comes within the sphere of obligation. Recognize the call emerging from the ashram or from the council chamber where waits the Lord of life himself, who is calling upon the spirit or monad to rise up out of uh, form and out of soul. The sound goes forth. Both soul and form together must renounce the principle of life and thus permit the monad to stand free. The soul responds. The form then shatters the connection. Life, the monadic aspect, is now liberated. 
owning the quality of conscious knowledge and the fruit of all experience. These are the gifts of soul and form combined. This is page 501 and 502 of Esoteric Healing. Yes, and this is where the spirit dissociates itself, not only from form, but from soul. And this is a final type of Piscean uh, consummation. So this dual bondage in which soul and uh, form are bound to each other is brought to an end by what I've called the final death, and which has been described in Law 10 of the, uh, the, the rules and laws of, uh, of esoteric healing. When the complete release of the life aspect, the rising one from the life of form takes place. So, you know, what is this? Let's just call this the fourth and fifth initiations. It should be borne in mind also that the soul itself is of the nature of form. Yes, because it's in the dense physical body of the solar logos, even though on the higher levels of that dense physical body. The soul itself is of the nature of form from the standpoint of the monad. Though it is a form far subtler than any that we know in the three worlds of human evolution. There is also, uh, so, so in other words, the Pisces also uh, rules in its hierarchical sense the release of spirit from the soul body. And this is, of course, the fourth, fourth degree. Later, is Pisces involved in the ultimate release of the monad from the spiritual triad itself? We can speculate. There is also a dual renunciation referred to in these key words. Dual renunciation. Bondage and captivity, renunciation and detachment, sacrifice and death. There is also a dual renunciation referred to in these key words. For first of all, the soul renounces the life and light of the monad. It comes, it, it leads. What is the soul? The soul is the the jiva, the awareness of the monad, which is projected down into the lower worlds. There is, uh, I leave my father's home and turning back, I say, but there's the part of it where we say, I leave my father's home because I am a lord of ceaseless and persevering devotion, of persevering ceaseless devotion. As such a lord of consciousness, I leave the highest state of the father of the monad, of that vast divine awareness, I leave that world of light and life. Uh, I leave the Father's home and descend. That soul descends into the ocean of matter. And that takes a long time. That's the entire uh, involutionary process. Uh, involutionary process. And then uh, the early uh, stages of evolution. Uh, during which there is not uh, self-consciousness. Then, reversing itself, the soul awakening to itself, let us say, awakening to its true spiritual nature, renounces the life of form, the personality center. The soul detaches itself in consciousness. Remember, now this is telling us that the Sutratma is not detached here, not until the very end is not detached. The soul detaches itself, still connected to the monad uh, by life, but in consciousness from the monad, the one, because all monads are one, and functions from its own center on the higher mental plane in the egoic lotus, in the causal body, making its own new and material attachments in the lower three worlds. So there is a descending detachment and an ascending detachment, and Pisces is ruling both of those. Uh, I leave the Father's home is certainly a Piscean mansion. It, it refers to the descent of the jiva, jivic consciousness from the realm of the monad. Then the prodigal son, who is also the soul, awakens to himself and leaves behind the uh, peripheral worlds of the personality. Uh, and becomes uh, fully soul conscious and eventually uh, spirit conscious. Then upon the reversal of the wheel, if the soul proceeds to detach itself from the personality and reattach itself 
to the consciousness of the one who sent it forth. So it is very right to say that the soul looks in two directions, uh, like uh, Janus, uh, the Roman two-faced uh, god, looks in two directions. Okay. Such is the climaxing story of Pisces. The lords of will and sacrifice, who are the monads, who are ourselves, come down into manifestation, sacrificing their high position and opportunities upon the higher planes of manifestation, i.e. the uh, worlds of the uh, cosmic ethers, in order to redeem matter, uh, redeem the matter of the uh, uh, dense physical body of the solar and planetary logos, and raise the lives by which it is informed, the lower creative hierarchies, to the status of themselves insofar as they constitute the fourth creative hierarchy. So uh, the mission is redemptive. And the spiritual hierarchies with which we are associated, uh, the lower ones as part of our bodies of expression, are to be redeemed by association with us. We are monads in extension. So this is our purpose. It's not some unhappy thing, although it does lead to much temporary uh, grief and limitation. It is a mission out of divine love from the Lord of persevering, ceaseless uh, devotion. Remember, Pisces is a major sign of love and uh, redemption. This is the subjective purpose underlying the sacrifice of these divine, i.e. Uh, uh, monadic lives, who are ourselves essentially, who are qualified by knowledge, love, and will. Well, we have that. You know, it's not like the monad is a tabula rasa. It's not a blank slate. The monad has had many forms of uh, experience, has knowledge, love, and will. So we want to say the monad is equipped and not a tabula rasa, not a blank slate by any means depending upon being informed by all that goes on within the lower life. It's not there so much to gather as it is to serve, although inevitably it does uh, gather some additional knowledge by life in the lower worlds. And animated by ceaseless, persevering devotion, the monad is animated by continually shining, shining like a sun, pulsating like a sun, ceaseless, persevering devotion. So this is the subjective purpose underlying the sacrifice of these divine lives who are ourselves essentially, who are qualified by knowledge, love, and will, and animated by ceaseless, persevering devotion. They seek to bring about the death of the form in its occult significance, the death of the form living only unto itself and not living unto a higher and more principal, principled pattern which can redeem it. They seek to bring about the death of the form in its occult significance and the consequent release of the indwelling lives into a higher state of consciousness. So uh, redemption is uh, elevation. Redemption whoops, uh, is elevation, and that should be in red. <laughs> All right, redemption is elevation, and we are seeking to uplift the lives with which we come in contact, just the way greater lives, to whom we are as little devas or even elementals, uh, are associating with us and uplifting us by their association. Of this process, all the world saviors, and remember Pisces is the sign of the world savior and of salvation, of this process, all the world saviors, past, present, and to come, are the manifested symbols and the eternal guarantees. There have been many world saviors before the appearance of the Christ, they guarantee this um, divine redemptive process in which we are all engaged and from which we are all benefiting. And we have to become redeemers or awaken to the fact that we set forth on our great pilgrimage as redeemers. We have set forth in this way. And we have uh, forgotten by becoming selfish and uh, we have forgotten our original purpose. And when we wake up to the plan of the soul and the purpose of the monad, we will again become unselfish redeemers. It is in such recognitions as these that the mainspring to the life of service must be sought. If we want to serve, we have to remember who we are. It's, there are many reasons to serve, but the deepest reason to serve is the recollection of why we set forth on our great pilgrimage. 
People born in the sign are frequently to be found serving the race and ministering to its needs. They are often ministers in the church upon some level of consciousness. The need of others is most important to the uh, advancing Piscean uh, individual. Uh, they live their life for others. The, the man for others, the life for others, uh, totally yours. Uh, totally for you. Uh, I was just in a convent the other day uh, uh, and I attended a Catholic mass, participated, and um, totus tuus was the motto of this order of Carmelite nuns. Uh, all for you or all yours. Uh, complete altruism. Thus they are prepared for the final sacrifice in Pisces, maybe that last incarnation uh, at the fourth degree, which absorbs them, them back into their originating motive. That's it. We have to recapture our motive, our motive uh, as monads who set forth on the great pilgrimage, um, as the old commentary expresses it. And we've forgotten our motive. And if we can but remember our motive, our entire service life will be reanimated and we will be living life with an entirely different orientation, not one of acquisition. Uh, it is for this reason that the life of service and the directed intention to serve constitute a scientific mode of achieving release, almost more powerful than meditation. At times, DK says it is more powerful than meditation. Service is more released and more redemptive even than meditation. The life of service and the directed intention to serve as the monad has that will to serve, constitute a scientific mode of achieving release because through the exercise of that life of service and that even personality intention or intention of the, of the um, soul within the personality to serve will bring us back to the realization of our originating motive. First, we realize what it is, then we're absorbed back into it and we become that divine will to serve. In Aquarius, the sign of world service, the lesson is finally learned, which produces the world savior in Pisces. Hence my constant emphasis on service. So there is here the accent upon the continuity of these two great signs of release, Aquarius being a sign in which you can take the third or fourth initiation, Pisces being a sign in which you can take the, uh, the fourth initiation so often, and even uh, perhaps the fifth initiation, uh, releasing you into Shambhala. Well, friends, uh, it looks like I've uh, done a two-hour program here without being canceled. Yeah, a little more. So let us call this, um, I don't want to press my luck here too much. <laughs> let us call this the uh, end uh, of EAA uh, 52. And we have gone as far as, well, maybe the best way to do that is to look down here. We've gone to page 117, and I think uh, 117, and where did we begin? Okay, we began, okay, that's EA 52 part one, and we, uh, well, that's about where we were, page 111. So we've gone from page 111 to 117 in a two-hour program. It takes a little bit to set these up in a different form. But hopefully um, they will be of value. And uh, when I feel that I'm on a roll, that I will be able to roll <laughs> instead of always having to stop after one hour. Although... If one talks too long, one loses oxygen, and perhaps the brain goes a little bit numb. <laughs> anyway, it's almost time for breakfast here, and I will attempt to continue this a little bit later. So let us, um, let us recite together the great invocation and conclude this uh, two-hour webinar. Okay. 
from the point of light within the mind of God. Let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. Oh. Okay, friends, thank you for attending. Uh, we are working on Pisces. We have concluded Aries, and in this um, Esoteric Astrology Adventure 52, we have the conclusion of Aries and the beginning of Pisces. So, we will uh, stop the process for now, and we'll talk to you soon with Esoteric Astrology Adventure 53, whether it's going to be of the normal one-hour length or longer, we will see. See you then. Bye-bye.